Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let the people of God say, Amen. Amen. Less than a week ago, Russian tanks and Russian artillery breached the border with Ukraine. For what now seems like months and months, the world was wondering and fretting, will he, will he not? Will the Russian president invade the neighbor? Or is the buildup of military power simply a ruse, you know, a, a threatening move in a geopolitical game of chess designed to intimidate the other side and to make concessions that otherwise might not happen? The newspaper headlines and news show interviews were full of speculation with analysts and so-called experts who, turns out, knew about as much as you and I did. <laughs> and then, after months of increasing worry that a new war was possible in Europe, last Thursday, the impossible did become reality, and our world changed again. Russia invaded its neighbor, and the killing and the dying continues as we speak. As if we needed a reminder of the tenuous hold that we have on life, already burdened and fatigued by a global pandemic entering its third year, now we confront new fears that the peace that we've taken for granted for the past 70 years may be shattered. As if we needed a reminder of the fact that as Psalm 23 puts it so succinctly, we always walk through the valley of the shadow of death all the days of our lives. Which is what Ash Wednesday is all about. And why this day is so important for us. It reminds us that we are all part of a broken world, a less than perfect humanity, a sinful world caught up in its own interests, and a world that continually confronts the stark reality of death. Ash Wednesday, you see, is that, is that terrible day of darkness and gloom. Did you catch that in the, in the first reading? That terrible day of darkness as gloom and gloom that the prophet Joel speaks about. Blow the trumpet, sound the alarm, he says. For the day of judgment is coming, a day of clouds and thick darkness. It's the day when we are finally forced to confront our own mortality, to again realize that our life ends at the grave. Ash Wednesday is a day when we make ourselves remember as we receive those ashes on our foreheads, when we remember that we are dust and that to dust we will return. Even back in Old Testament times, people associated ashes and dust with regrets, with repentance, with a passionate cry for restoration, for new life. More than one king in Israel's long history ended up in ashes and sackcloth following grave offenses. That dirty smudge that we're going to put on your forehead, that's a stark reminder of what's in store for you, a terrible future that cannot be denied. Of course, most of the time we do a great job denying it. I mean, how many times a day do you really think about your own death? Even those of us who have more days behind us than we have in front of us, even those of us who may live with illness and broken bodies, those, those who have re received the dreaded diagnosis and know that death isn't that far off, we still manage to pretty much pretend that we are not going to die. Am I right? Are you with me? All of us would rather not contemplate what lies ahead and live our lives as though it might continue forever, as though death didn't inevitably stand at the end, as though we'd have all the time in the world. A pastor colleague in, in Illinois in an article in Christian Century this week called the ashen cross on our foreheads a billboard for mortality a walking sign for all to see that we are bound to death. 
which is particularly jarring if you think about our culture and how it contributes to denying death as a universal experience. Ours is a culture that values life and youth and vigor. I mean, all you have to do is to look at advertisements for pretty much anything from soap powder to fast food joints. Young, healthy looking, vigorous, usually handsome people trying to tell us that life is good and would be even better if we just bought that product that they are pushing on us. It's not a hint of the transience of life, not a whiff of death and decay anywhere close to those commercials. Our culture is obsessed with preserving youth and delaying death as long as humanly possible. There are entire industries, right, that promise to keep you young if only you use their face cream or join their health club or buy their performance-enhancing dietary supplements. Medical science is at a point where they can keep you breathing and living long beyond any reasonable life expectancy. If only you have the right health insurance. And when death finally does come to someone we love, your friendly neighborhood funeral home will discreetly arrange things so everything is dignified and nobody will have to confront the reality of death in all of its finality and ugliness. Because, you know, the person that has died hasn't really died. We loathe that word. No, the person we say has passed away or gone home or gone to heaven. Our culture idolizes youth, denies death and dying. Our culture wants to pretend that death doesn't exist. Our culture wants to sanitize death when it does occur. Which is why Ash Wednesday is so important. Ash Wednesday, this somber day on the church's calendar, this gateway to Lent, reminds us that, the end, that at the end of life stands the grave. But there is good news too. Because we serve a God who is full of mercy and grace and love, and because of this forgiving and patient God, Ash Wednesday isn't just a day of doom and gloom and death and dying. Our God turns this day into a day of blessing. This is important. It's the central message today. So turn to your neighbor, tell your neighbor, our God turns this day into a day of blessing. Just look at this reading from Joel, right? This prophet of doom and gloom who says in verse 12, Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. Yet even now, and here comes the great good news, even now in the face of death and destruction, the Lord says to us, yet even now, what sweet words, return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding, abounding in steadfast love. Oh, what a powerful word of life that is. What a powerful word of life in the face of dark death throughout these 40 days of Lent. What a glorious promise at the threshold of the grave. Oh, what a life-giving, death-defying, earth-shattering word of hope. Just when you thought there wasn't any hope. Can someone say amen to that? Because it turns out people of God, it turns out that death is not the final answer after all. It turns out that our lives do not end at the grave, but begin there. We can face our mortality because that is precisely the place where God meets us and where new life begins. Amen? Amen. Return to the Lord your God, who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abiding in steadfast love. Now, Joel, you may have noticed, sings a slightly different tune than Jesus does in our gospel from Matthew today, and maybe their conflicting stories need a big bit of unpacking here. Blow the trumpet, Joel says. But Jesus wants us to hide away in our rooms and pray in private. 
Sound the alarm, Joel urges, but Jesus wants us to do good deeds in secret. Call an assembly, Joel says, gather the people. But Jesus would rather be faced by ourselves without telling anyone, without making a big fuss about how religious we are. You see, in this passage from Matthew, Jesus is lifting up three practices that would have been very familiar to his audience, to observant Jewish people of his day, practices that people would do privately. Praying, fasting, giving alms, or doing good deeds. Every Jew knew that daily prayer was one of the basic expectations of the faith. And so if you were a Jew in Jesus' day, you'd say your prayers every day and you'd go to the synagogue on a regular basis. Every Jew knew that fasting was part of the faith. In fact, there are five fast days in the Jewish year, the most familiar being Yom Kippur, the day of repentance and seeking forgiveness. Every Jew knew that almsgiving, doing good, was an expectation of Judaism. In fact, it was the way in which poor people and widows and orphans were being taken care of. So you see, as Jesus is teaching this, he's on familiar ground here. He's speaking and teaching about faith practices that were as familiar to the Jewish audience of his day as they are to us today. Only, Jesus turns things around again. You know, he's really good at that. He turns things around and he complains that people are doing the right things for the wrong reasons. They pray and they show off doing it. They fast and they make long faces so everybody will know what they are doing and praise them for it. They give charitable donations and then they brag about it. Those attitudes, Jesus tells them, won't get us far with God. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on, heaven, on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven for your, where your treasure is. There will be your heart also. So see, it's, it's about motivation. It's about why we do what we do. It's about what's really important to us and what has priority in our lives. It's about doing the right things for the right reason. I know it's kind of counterintuitive to have Jesus say to us today that we should practice our religion in private. And then we run around all day long with that dirty smudge on our foreheads getting curious stares in the grocery store and the doctor's office. But, but you see, that smudge does something publicly that we'd rather keep private, facing our own mortality. And then it does something that is worth advertising to the world and sharing widely. That dirty smudge says to the world that we are imperfect people, beholden to sin, mired in conflict, destined for death, but also that we are a forgiving people, a forgiven people, that we receive grace and mercy and forgiveness from a loving God. Because you see, that dirty old smudge on your forehead isn't just a blob of ash and dirt and oil. We, we don't just smear those nasty ashes on you any old way. And we don't just sprinkle the ashes on top of your heads either as they did in Old Testament times. No, no. That smudge we make on your forehead has the form of a cross. A cross, the ultimate symbol of hope and of love and of life. The ultimate symbol of how God can turn death into life, crucifixion into resurrection, mortality into everlasting living. Because it is on that cross that Jesus defeats death itself and opens for us, as we say in our Lutheran funeral liturgy, the way to eternal life. The cross for us is a sign of life, is a symbol of Jesus' victory over death and the grave, is the assurance that death, our death, our own death, as afraid as we may be of it, 
is nothing more than a gateway to a new life with God. A new life in a new world without violence and pain and war and invasions. A new life that will last forever. And that, siblings in Christ, is the good news on this supposedly gloomy Ash Wednesday. And to that, let the people of God say, Amen. Amen.